Hi, welcome to Untold Stories of Black Arlington. My name is Wilma Jones and I'll be your host. I'm a pretty much a native Arlingtonian. I live in the Halls Hill Highview Park neighborhood. I'm a civic activist. And two years ago, I wrote a book called My Halls Hill Family, More Than a Neighborhood. That pretty much turned me into a local historian. So I'll be coming to you in Untold to tell you information about Arlington's Black history that you may not be aware of. We're gonna to start tonight's show with a story about an incredible component of Arlington's segregated Black history called the Negro Recreation Section. This Negro Recreation Section was a part of Arlington County's Parks and Recreation Division. Started in 1948 and running through 1962 until the integration of recreation in 1963, the Negro Recreation Section provided organized activities, both sports and arts for the segregated black community in Arlington. But you may wonder, why did that even get started? Let's talk about it a little bit. In the 1940s in Arlington, there were no recreation facilities for black children in the segregated neighborhoods. As you can see from these Washington Post articles, the bond had been approved for recreation facilities for Negro children. However, each time a proposal came before the Arlington County Board, it failed to get the number of majority votes in order to have the funding approved. As a matter of fact, with a proposal for a park near the Halls Hill neighborhood, the president of the Virginia Hospital Association at that time called the Arlington Hospital Association, along with 60 members of the Woodlawn neighborhood came to the county board to protest because they believed that having Negro children play near their facilities would reduce the value of their properties. And now let's talk to our guests. First, I'd like for Ms. Sandra Green to give us her introduction. Sandra. I'm Sandra Green. I'm a native Arlingtonian and I grew up in Halls Hill. I participated in the Negro section of recreation from the time that I was probably six years old until 19, probably 63. So all of my childhood and my teen years, I participated in all of the Negro uh, programs in recreation. And now George Jones, our second guest, would you introduce yourself, please? My name is George Jones. Again, I was raised in Arlington. Uh, I was a participant in all of the early sports that we've had in Halls Hill, which is now Highview Park, you know, from baseball, basketball. And uh, I did those straight on through high school. Now, Sandra, when you and I have talked, I believe that you engaged in a larger range of activities with the Negro Recreation Section. Could you talk to us a little bit about that, please? I think my favorite activity was ballet. Um, I was introduced to ballet um, when I participated at Langston Center. So I participated in ballet and tap. Uh, I participated in all of the musical productions that were done by all of the neighborhoods. Uh, I participated in the parades. I played softball and participated in the special events. So I was kind of uh, into most of it. And as I did some research, I was able to find some pictures. Let me see if I can share my screen with you, Sandra. And Sandra, I wanted to just share this picture with you. Can you see that? I can see it. And there for our audience is Sandra. 
And Sandra, this was a performance of Madame Poo Poo's Wedding in 1955 that we found from the archives. Now, we also found ballet. And this was a ballet that was done at Langston. Now, Sandra, can you talk a little bit more about the misrecreation pageants and the way that the different segregated neighborhoods and communities came together in the Negro recreation section? And maybe a little bit about those playgrounds? It started in around 1949. Mr. Johnson, who was the supervisor of Negro recreation, was working at the YMCA and he saw a need for a greater and a broader program for black children in Arlington. So he organized a track meet and invited the director of recreation to come to see the track meet. And she went and um, offered him a part-time job uh, supervising and organizing recreation for the African-American children. And it wasn't planned to be anything permanent. It was um, just something that they did probably to appease him. But four months later, he was hired as the first full-time African-American recreation professional in Arlington. And thus started programs in all of the black neighborhoods, Green Valley, Johnson Hill, Halls Hill, and Hatsville. Those were the names of the black communities then. Uh, we had programs at the predominantly black schools after school. We had summer playgrounds in our uh, neighborhoods. Um, and uh, Mr. Johnson then began to organize all types of activities in all of the neighborhoods. I know that the voters passed the bonds so that the facilities could be um, provided, but that the county board refused to approve them. Can you talk a bit about the first center that was finally approved outside the schools for Negro recreation? The first building um, that was not a school in the black community was Carver Center. And Carver Center was an old um, military base. It wasn't a military base, but it was used for military government, for the government. And when the Pentagon expanded and they didn't have a use for the building anymore, Mr. Johnson lobbied for that to become the first Black Recreation Center. So that was in Arlington View, uh, and that was Carver Center. And that was probably in 1959. What was the importance of the Negro Recreation Section to the Black community at that time? George? It was very important to the black community in Halls Hill. As a matter of fact, in, in all, the, all uh, developments, because it centralized uh, activities, organized activities for uh, kids and teenagers, rather than just being something uh, haphazard. It was an organized uh, athletics, uh, be it basketball, softball, and e eventually the fields and so forth that we played on and courts that we played on were really brought up to a uh, standard where they were, they were not just fields to play in, they were actually baseball diamonds, uh, basketball courts that were full, uh, full court, and uh, other activities that went on, you know, for people that didn't play athletics, they could, you know, play checkers, cards, or whatever. But it was an organized area for teenagers and young, and young people to come and be safe and just fraternize and be, be active. Now, Sandra, what's your perspective on that? It was our safe haven. We didn't have any place to have recreation prior to the Negro section. So, you know, anything we did then, we would pretty much have to go to Washington to do. So this was our opportunity to 
have structured activities in Arlington for African Americans. Um, and it was an introduction for many of us into areas of interest that we knew nothing about. Um, it was ballet, it was tap, it was uh, baton twirling, it was track and field. And it was an introduction into many, many things that we had never experienced. Uh, and for some people that went on to become careers. So it was important. Now, Mr. Johnson didn't have the resources initially um, that he needed. So he was the type of person that had a huge volunteer corps to support the activities. Uh, in any activity that we were in, if a uniform was required, we had the uniforms. Uh, if there was a big uh, theatrical production to go on, we had costumes. And all of this was done through volunteers in all of the Black neighborhoods. Uh, they would come together and to support whatever Mr. Johnson had. He had the support of the PTAs, of the churches, of the business, uh, black businesses. So it was a total community effort to keep this thing going the way that it should go. And that included the citizens associations, correct? Absolutely. So he had a lot of support from right from within the community to sustain the programs. Mr. Johnson was able to get black professionals to come in to teach those classes like golf, and archery and ballet and dance and tap um, and even more. So do you know how he got those instructors and do you remember the names of any of them and what they taught? Yes, Mr. Johnson had a connection with the recreation uh, department in the city. So he knew a lot of people in, that, in the different fields that he needed in terms of leadership. So we had um, trained uh, people in tap dance, Miss Clara Harrington. We had Mr. Barnhill, who was trained in ballet. Um, we had, uh, I can't remember the lady's name, who taught baton twirling. We had Mr. Miller, who had the drum and bugle corps. Um, we had people who were certified uh, Boy Scout and Girl Scout leaders. So you know, we had people who were trained, um, who were teaching us. It wasn't just anybody. Now, George, you had mentioned Mr. Willie Jones, who was a star basketball player at American University and later in life, an award-winning coach at the University of District of Columbia. He was a part of the Negro Recreation Section too, right? Yes, correct. Uh, Mr. Johnson was very resourceful. And the thing was, people saw the product that he was producing, uh, you know, uh, with, and he received help from, from you know, various people throughout the, the area. But whatever, whatever section it was, whether it was Halls Hill, Green Valley, Johnson Hill, Hatchfield, uh, he had people that would come in and assist him in keeping programs going to assist in training and so forth. And it worked out, it worked out for the good for all of us because I was a product of that. Let's talk about that man, Mr. Ernest Johnson. He is without question a hero in terms of black recreation in Arlington what he accomplished and the thousands of children and young people he influenced is just incredible, especially considering the resources that he had to work with. And he was so trusted by the black community. Sandra, can you talk about Mr. Johnson a little bit? Mr. Uh, Johnson had a way of bringing people together um, people in all the communities trusted him. He would drive his station wagon around from community to community to pick up children, to take them to special events. He organized um, field trips. Um, and 
you know, what people need to understand is early on, he didn't I'd have a huge staff. His first full-time employee was Eugene Green, who was a kid in the neighborhood who attended recreation and uh, showed a propensity to uh, be able to be in a leadership position. So he was the first full-time hire. And um, they went on to just do magnificent things in neighborhoods. But Mr. Johnson was trusted. And he was a person that did not wait for the county uh, to give him everything that he needed or did not say what he could not do. He always made a way for it to happen for the children. And it was not only children. There were young adults yes. that participated in golf and uh, badminton. Um, and it wasn't Tennis. just all children. So yes. it was people of all ages. Go ahead, George. Eugene, uh, Big Pete from Johnston Hill, uh, he had uh, Mr. Perry over at Fort Bernard, uh, Sherman Anderson. He had P uh, older guys that he could count on to do, to prepare the uh, baseball fields, to line it out and so forth, to referee basketball games and so forth. He, he was a heck of an organizer because he kept everything fluid, everything going like it should. And he had some of the best cars. He had some of the best station wagons because he drove them loaded with kids from one side of Arlington to the other. Oh, he, he, was, <laughs> he was an inspiration. He was an inspiration to everyone. And you didn't want to let him down. So he, he had all the the all of the necessary people doing what they could do best for the community. Now let's talk about the different events. I mean, as I look through the archives, I remembered Sandra, a conversation that we had where you talked about a mishap that happened at one of the programs. Could you share that with the audience, please? Uh, when, when they had one of the musical productions that included all the children, if you were in ballet or tap, you were included in the musical productions at the end of the, the uh, classes. And the, this Madame Poo Poo's wedding had um, special effects. And that was way back when. Um, and it was where some smoke was supposed to come up <laughs> out of something. Well, something caught fire. And they had to call the fire trucks. Uh, but the show went on. <laughs> But I mean, it's just to show that they tried to have top level activities for us. Um, one of the activities that I would love to share is the parades that we had. It was the, always at the end of the summer and all of the children in Arlington would go to Green Valley and we would convene on Pollard Street to line up for the parade. And it would be about 300 kids in this parade. I mean, if you played ball, if you were in any classes, if you were a major rep, if you were in the drum and bugle corps, if you won one event, if you won the ping pong yeah. tournament or anything, you were in the parade. So everybody was in the parade. And we marched from uh, Fort Bernard down to Jenna Dean, where a queen, queen was crowned. And each neighborhood had had their own queens um, crowned for their playground. But at the big event, we had one queen that came, was crowned um, to represent uh, the Negro section of recreation. And everything that we did appeared in the paper, uh, in the Afro. So any week you could pick up the Afro and you may see your name in there. Mr. Johnson would put those kids' names in there for, you know, all the teams were represented in terms of what they had done and where they were uh, on the schedule and how they fared in, in the games. Um, if you won a tournament, your name was in the paper. So for kids then, that was a big deal. I mean, there was no other newspaper that would put your name in or put your picture. And the Afro that you're speaking of is the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper, which was the flagship newspaper in the Afro-American line 
Um, I believe it's been operating since maybe 1890 something, but yes. That's right. And Mr. Johnson had a weekly column. Sometimes he had a whole page. Your picture could appear because he partnered with Skurlock, who was a professional photographer in DC that did all major events. So he came into Arlington and took all the pictures for um, recreation. Yes, we will show more pictures from the archives at the Arlington Center for Local History, which is online as well as being at the Arlington Central Library. But let's talk a little bit more about Jenny Dean, that playground in the Green Valley neighborhood. I mean, there were a number of playgrounds, Jenny Dean, Carver, um, Fort Bernard. I mean, is that right, Sandra? Yeah, and HB yeah. is where Carver was. Right. But, you know, that's Carver Center. There was Jenna Dean, there was Highview, Halls Hill Playground, and there was Hatsfield had a playground. Right, and Walter Reed later. And Walter Reed came a little later. But yeah, yeah those were the Black communities. But Jenny Dean was the largest playground, right? And for the summer program, the tournaments, the events, and especially those Friday nights at, were all at Jenny Dean, correct? I mean, even when I grew up, uh, which was in the integrated days, Jenny Dean was the place for black youth on Friday nights. But I assume that even then it was more essential because there were so few places and outlets for black youth to have organized recreation. Could you talk a bit about that, George? Jenny Dean was the largest uh, of them all because you could also, you could have basketball going on at the same time that you had baseball going on and tennis. And it was, it was just a, I don't know how many, uh, what the acreage was, but it was very large. And uh, everyone came down there on Friday nights, you know, you might have the uh, uh, men's ba baseball playing or you could have games between uh, certain, uh, like Halls Hill and, and Green Valley or Johnson Hill. It was a lot of activity going on. At, at, and you could just walk around just nice or sit in the bleachers and root for your team. Or you can be over playing tennis. Or you could just, you know, be playing basketball. So it was a, it was a big area for uh, various teams to be there and compete under the lights. And that was another thing. It was under the, they had, you know, everything was, had over, had big lights so you could play up until they cut them off at night, 11 o'clock or something. Now, that was not true with the other playgrounds. They didn't have lights, is that correct? Uh, not until yes, later. Not then. Sandra, I want to ask your opinion of the importance of Jenny Dean from the perspective of the youth going to segregated elementary schools in their neighborhood, but then all black youth going to HB junior, senior high school together. What was the importance of meeting the people from the other black neighborhoods in recreation? All of the big events were held at Jenna Dean, Tr track and field, um, a lot of the parties were held there. So it was a place where you got to meet the kids from all over Arlington, the, all of the black kids. That's where we went. So because we all went to the same junior and senior high school, um, once you finished elementary school, we all went to the same school. So we met our friends that we would be in school with later in later years, right down there at Jenna Dean. And we established lifelong friendships. I know that I have friends that I met uh, in recreation, uh, maybe competing against them or participating in a program with them that have become, been my lifetime friends. We've talked a bit about the end of year events in recreation like Miss Recreation, but was there a program after that parade you know, was there any type of recognition? And were the parents involved? The parents came and there was a program. Um, each community had children to perform. So um, for instance, there may have been 
three tap dance groups from, from one from each community and each group performed, but then they always ended up performing something together. They were all taught a dance that they came together to do. So it was always um, in the end, everybody together, but there was always a program. You had people who sang, you had people who played instruments. Uh, the awards were given out for the different leagues. Uh, and at that time, baseball was the dominant sport. Uh, uh, not basketball, uh, baseball was the dominant sport. So all of the trophies were given out at the, the event. Parents were there. Um, a lot of times you had parents who were preparing food for all of the participants. Um, and when it wasn't an event of that nature, we all went to the Weenie Beanie, and it's still there. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> went to the Weenie Beanie. Best hot dogs in the world. Now let's circle back to Negro recreation and the exposure that it provided for Black youth. I mean, I was really surprised at some of the things that Mr. Johnson was able to give exposure to. I mean, the trips. Let's talk about an experience like going swimming in DC at a pool because there were no athletic resources available, I mean, aquatic resources available for black youth in Arlington, correct? Correct. That's it. For swimming, we would go to East Potomac Pool. East Potomac, yeah. Um, and that's where the swimming took place. Uh, but we went on field trips many places. I can remember a field trip to Assateek to see the horses cross the, the horses gallop somewhere. We went to Gettysburg. I don't know why, but we did uh, in the station wagon. And there was the annual trip to the Penn Relays, which was yes. the introduction to track and field. That's where all of the black colleges uh, came and competed. And it was an introduction for us to uh, HBCUs. You know, we just, yeah. it, it exposed us to many things that we would have never been exposed to. Uh, ballet, there weren't many people ballet dancing during that time. Um, that was way before this little girl, Missy Copeland now. Mm -hmm. You know, while she is new today, there have been black ballet dancers around a long time. Um, but yeah, you know, kids today think that she's, this is brand new to us, but it isn't. And, and the tap dancing was good. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, black people didn't have a lot of disposable income in those times. So even if those types of classes and courses were available to black children, many families would not have been able to provide that to their children. So the fact that all of us lived in these segregated neighborhoods together and that it didn't matter whether your parents were professionals or government workers or maids or housekeepers or whether they worked in the hospital or a chauffeur, when you had um, all of these people across the socioeconomic spectrum together and you have Negro recreation with everybody's kids all together. Can you speak about the importance of that? It that, that was how everything developed. Uh, it's just like in, in one neighborhood, you might go to, it might be two or three different churches in that neighborhood, but the kids and the young adults all went to their own church, but after church, everyone came out, changed clothes, went up on the playground, and started doing whatever they wanted to till their parents called them home for dinner as far as, you know, playing basketball or softball. You know, you tried to wait for enough people to get there sometimes to have, you know, you know, teams. So you just played, you know, uh, one, you know, just play individually. Somebody would be batting you, you get them out, somebody else would go up. But the whole neighborhood charmed in. You knew everybody in the neighborhood. Everybody was, they weren't related, but they knew each family. They knew your kids because you could go from one house to another house 
and you wouldn't even knock on the door. You just go right through the kitchen door. Where is so and so and so? Uh, that's how the neighborhoods were. That's how you develop that camaraderie in your neighborhood. Uh, and it worked straight on through because segregation was here for a long time. And each community de developed pretty much the same way. And then when you got old enough or Mr. Johnson had you in other activities and you go from one section, go from Halls Hill to Green Valley or wherever you're going, you meet other people until high school. Everyone was um, equal. There was no distinction. Um, we were all on the same level in terms of how we were perceived. Mr. Johnson saw children as children and people as people, and he wanted the best for everybody. So that's what was instilled in us. Um, and any competition that we had was friendly competition. Um, that was mandated. It was, you know, mandated that it all be friendly. Um, and out of survival, we were always there for each other and our parents were there for each other. We didn't have anything else but each other. We didn't have access to all the other things, but we didn't know it. We did not feel that we had lost or didn't have anything because we had everything that we needed in order to grow in a way that you should grow. What was important to our parents was that, you know, we have opportunities that they, they didn't have, that we respected each other. Uh, and Mr. Johnson was just in that same mindset. So it all kind of came together. Let's talk more about that influence. What were some, who were some people that were exposed to activities at Negro Recreation who were influenced so much that they made it a part of their life? Charles Augins, who grew up here in Highview Park, took his first dance lesson at Langston in the Negro section. And he is currently the Dean of the Dance Department at Duke Ellington School of the Arts. And prior to that, he, um, taught dance in London, lived in London. He appeared in Bubbling Brown Sugar and a lot of other Broadway shows. Uh, you have Leander Morgan, who was uh, a playground supervisor who went on to become the mayor of New Bern, North Carolina. Um, you have Willie Jones and we spoke about him. Eugene Green had a career in um, recreation, retired. I retired from recreation in Arlington after 29 years. Uh, George was in recreation for a good while. So Mr. Johnson provided um, an opportunity for many kids to have employment. Um, who wouldn't have had employment? At one time, I'm sure he was one of the few persons where a, a college, a black kid coming home from college could get a job. So he gave a lot of employment opportunities to the youth and, and adults in, in Arlington. George, are there any folks that you might remember? I'm gonna start out with me. Because uh, <clears throat> when I graduated from Hoffman, Boston, uh, there was a scholarship offered me from somebody named Paul Napper from West Virginia that had seen me pitch a game. And I guess he might have seen me pitch more than one in high school and in recreation. But I, between his contacts with a school called Stillman College in Alabama, I got a scholarship to go to Alabama. <laughs> well, it turned out to be a very good move because once I graduated, uh, I got drafted into the Army. And then George, what was that degree in? Physical education. So uh, Mr. Johnson had, had long arms, but he could reach out and help you along, whether he was there or not. But then uh, when I got out of the Army, I got a job with DC Recreation. 
and I ran into Mr. Johnson about after about two weeks of being uh, working for DC, and I saw Mr. Johnson, and Mr. Johnson asked me, boy, it's good to see you home. What are you doing? I said, I work for DC Recreation Department. He said, come down, come down my house this evening and get an application. And uh, I put my notice in with DC and started working in Arlington up at Fort Bernard with Eugene Green. And I later moved over to uh, run Walter Reed Recreation Center, which was right half a mile away. And I worked there for seven years. But uh, I met so many people that Mr. Johnson uh, brought up, uh, like I said, Big Pete, just people that you that you just develop relationships with, people that you could depend on to help you. If you were short an a umpire at a game or something, you'd see somebody in the stand, you said, look, I need help. I got one man, one referee had not shown up. They able to do a good job. And you know, you want you wanted to to show up well for Mr. Johnson and for your neighborhood. You just, you know, you you didn't want to lose too many games, or you wanted to win every one you could, but you had people that he uh helped along to help us along. So it, it went stair step right on up through through when I, you know, retired from the uh when I left the recreation department and went to work for the phone company. But he he did that that organization so well. Uh, it's really amazing how successful he was. Yes, Mr. Johnson accomplished things that many would think were impossible. He was the leader of the Negro Recreation Section from its inception in 1948 until integration in 1963. And then he became a supervisor in the integrated parks and recreation. So he was super influential. So can we talk about how things changed in Negro recreation? Because we know that we were all exposed to and a victim of institutional racism. And I'm sure that staff were as well. So can we talk about integration and the black community as far as recreation? In 1963, when the programs integrated, it did change some things. Now, we retained the programs in our communities. Um, everybody didn't rush to integrate. Um, the programs were there. We could avail ourselves of them if we wanted to but we predominantly stayed in our neighborhoods. We were happy with what we had. Um, we, there was no rush to go to other places. Um, our recreation had been, a lot of our programs were supported by parents and uh, community volunteers. And when the, in 1963, when um, the programs integrated, that wasn't the way that Arlington County's programs were supported. So what was lost in that time is the camaraderie that we had with all the communities because we no longer came together for events. Um, we were separated in our own neighborhoods. Um, things were just very different. We didn't have our Negro League anymore. Um, we became a part of other leagues. And some of it, you, were, you didn't become part of the opportunities, the, the programs that were going on in other neighborhoods because you still weren't welcome. We lost what we had and still had trouble accessing the things that were there for us didn't feel a part of it often, didn't feel wanted often. So I think it was a great loss for us uh, when, when things as we knew them changed. Uh, but I think that's one reason that I went into the field because I really wanted to see that our neighborhoods continue to our kids to be nurtured in the way that they were nurtured. 
and not to become just a number or be lost out there and not know where to go or how to access. Um, so I went into the field for that reason, because I thought that what I had growing up was unmistakably wonderful. And I wanted to try to give that to the kids that were coming up uh, underneath. Yes, that is so important, Sandra. Uh, I remember coming up in recreation with when you were um, one of the leaders at the um, Langston Brown Recreation Center and how important that was. And I do want to mention that I remembered one other person from Negro Recreation under Mr. Uh, Johnson, who was just very important in the Langston neighborhood, and that would be Mrs. Hazel Brown. She ran the cafeteria at Langston, and she ran the summer um, program for Negro Recreation on the Highview Park playground. So, how, George, what are your thoughts on integration? You know, I don't know when uh, Mr. Johnson uh you know stop working there but the it seemed like the the he was the the hub in this wheel that helped us continue uh doing what we did and once uh they delineated you know our abilities to uh be together it it really it was it was it was it was rough it really was. Well, thank you, George. We appreciate that perspective. And I appreciate you and Sandra for being here as our guests on the show today. As we close this interview section of the program, I wanna give you both a minute or two to give us your closing thoughts on what you believe Negro Recreation Section meant to Black history in Arlington and how it contributed to the growth and development of so many Black children in the Arlington community. George, can you go first for us, please? We had, we, we had a nucleus of, of uh, organization to organize, to participate, to know who could do what, uh, it, it was it was the strength of that particular uh, nucleus of people who really got involved and it was more than than talk they people actually uh, not that just talked a good game but they they did the work that was necessary to inspire people to be involved in things it made kids and people want to uh, try this activity and pursue it to be good at it, and that that was uh, a good thing. It was I'm like Sandra. I I don't before before integration. I think we were doing well. We we were. It was enjoyable to do what we were doing, meeting people, and it was like a a, a real social function regardless of whatever the activity was, but just to go to different places, meet other people, uh, uh, you know, play against them and play with them. You know, it, it was, it was, that, that's what was missed. Thank you, George. Now, Sandra, I remembered one more thing. So as you close, could you talk a little bit about the bus trips that I believe you all took? I think it was New York, but maybe I'm wrong. But as you close out and give us your thoughts on Negro recreation in Arlington, could you talk a little bit about that trip too? No, we didn't. We went to, in the bus, it wasn't to New York. Uh, where did we go in the bus? No, maybe the bus was to the pin relays, but I do remember the bus because the bus was so rickety. Um, wasn't your finest bus, but we made it. I mean, we always made it and we made it back. Um, but what I want people to understand is that during those years, there was a camaraderie and a sense of community like people don't know today. Um, we felt safe, we felt loved, we 
had what we needed. Um, we looked out for each other. And, you know, it. we were taught that if you don't see a way, you make a way. So, and I think that that's lost today. I think that uh, while there are a lot of good things that are going on, that go on in the world today, I think a lot of the basics that we grew up with are, are not important anymore. Um, but it's those things that made us who we are. And I think if you look at a lot of the people that grew up in our generation and grew up in Halls Hill, Green Valley, Johnson Hill, and Hatsville when we did, we did okay. I mean, I think we a lot, we did okay. Um, and we were not influenced by a lot of the negative forces out there. Exactly. You know, these segregated communities, the schools, the churches, the citizens associations, I wanted to do this story because I wanted to add the importance of the Negro Recreation Section to this discussion in the mix. I wanted to talk to our untold audience about the Negro Recreation Section because it was super influential and because it's vastly untold. Most people are unaware of this important part of Arlington's Black history. Again, I wanna thank you two for both sharing with me and the audience your remembrances and perspectives on Negro recreation. And I wanna thank the audience again for sharing their time to hear more about another piece of an untold story of Arlington's Black history. The Green Valley Newsletter published a tribute to Mr. Ernest Johnson after his passing. I'd like to share it with the audience here today. Mr. Johnson was born in Ohio and educated in Washington, D.C. and West Virginia. He was an Army veteran who had a great love for recreation. Here you see a note of appreciation from Mr. Johnson's family for all of the gratitude shown to them in his passing. Here are pictures from Mr. Johnson's archives. And tributes to Mr. Johnson, also known as Cigar Johnson and the man with the station wagon. More pictures from the archives showing the tennis team, scout troops, and more. Here we'll share the obituary from Mr. Johnson's homegoing service. More pics from the archives. Now we're sharing Mr. Johnson's newspaper clippings of articles from columns in the Afro-American newspaper, which Sandra spoke about earlier. Here's a picture of a 1955 performance and different children and adults at recreation activities. Here's a tribute to Mr. Johnson's contributions to Arlington Recreation. Now, more of Mr. Johnson's columns in the Afro newspaper. Here's a great picture of Mr. Johnson congratulating Conrad Deskins, a black Arlingtonian, as he prepared to leave for a tryout with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And here's another Arlington profile of Mr. Johnson. 
and then articles about Arlington's Black neighborhoods, colored nine baseball teams, all supported by Mr. Johnson in his newspaper columns. And final remarks by Dr. Alfred O. Taylor. We wanna share with you this evening some pictures from the archives of Mr. Ernest E. Johnson that is in the Arlington Center for Local History housed at the Central Library, but also available online. We shared a couple of the pictures during the interview section, but I wanna run through and let you all see just a bit of these incredible images that are available from the Negro Recreation section in Arlington. First, boys in football uniforms. The ABC baseball team in 1952 a boys basketball game. Warren Jackson, Mr. Pryor, and Ernest Johnson. Two women shaking hands over the tennis court. Adults and young baseball players. The men's team receiving trophy. The youth football team. Langston Blazers basketball team. Woman dancing, 1963. Girls tap class, 1963. Children performing in cowboy costumes. You can see these images and more at the Arlington Center for Local History's online archives. There'll be a link in the credits at the end of, the, of this episode. On each episode of Untold Stories of Black Arlington, we're gonna have a mini segment, which will feature a person, event, or organization in Black Arlington that we wanna make sure you know. So for this first segment of Did You Know, we're going to focus on a hero of the Green Valley neighborhood. Mr. John Robinson. John Robinson was a hero in the Green Valley neighborhood and in the greater Arlington Black community. He was a respected civic activist and the founder and executive director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center in the Green Valley neighborhood. In the 1960s, he began to publish the weekly newsletter, The Green Valley News, which we just saw in the tribute to Mr. Johnson. As this Washington Post article notes, in the 1980s, he was a one-man war on drugs in the Green Valley neighborhood. He worked to support the homeless, the hungry, and all underserved. And in this other Washington Post article, you can see he's reflected as a Don Quixote. He was involved in the Veterans Memorial YMCA, the Congress of Racial Equality, the Green Valley Civic Association, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and the United Planning Organization. John was a product of Arlington segregated schools, having gone to Kemper Elementary and Hoffman Boston Junior Senior High School. He attended Howard University and served in the US Army. John died in July, 2010 at age 75. John Robinson was an Arlington hero. We've come to the end of this episode of Untold Stories of Black Arlington. Thank you very much for joining us. And I hope that you'll join us for upcoming episodes. Our hope is that you have learned something about Arlington history that maybe you didn't know when the show began. Thank you very much. And please let us know your feedback, your comments, and if you have any suggestions for upcoming stories, we would love to hear from you. Thank you. <laughs>